Teachers in Ontario and Saskatchewan are both in the middle of difficult negotiations and the risk of a job action looms. And I'm a teacher in Saskatchewan and I've heard a lot of misinformation around bargaining. So I thought it'd be a good time to clear the air. Because there are governments that have spent decades trying to weaponize public opinion against teachers. And instead of actually dealing with the issues facing education, they're just trying to distract everybody with culture wars. So I think in order to understand what's going on, we need a bit of background. So let's look at Ontario first. Now, Ontario has four different bargaining groups, but today we're just going to focus on the public and we're going to focus on elementary. Right now they have the OECTA, the AFFO, the ETFO, and the OSSTF. Today we're just going to talk about the ETFO, the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario. Uh, the reason why is just to look at one set of numbers, but they're fairly comparable across the board. Now it's worth noting that certain elements of these contracts are negotiated locally, and the other important thing to note here is that there are a lot of non-monetary things that are negotiated too, so the numbers aren't exactly parallel, but I think there's a lot worth comparing here. Because one of the biggest themes that emerges in both stories is an attack on the teacher's rights. Now, in Ontario the story goes back a long way, really to the history of education, but we're going to pick it up in 2012. Now, following a contentious round of bargaining, Premier Dalton McGuinty and his Liberal government rolls out Bill 115, which they called the Putting Students First Act. It was incredibly draconian. It stripped bargaining rights, it blocked the Labor Relations Board and the court from investigating whether or not it violated bargaining rights. It subjected all teachers in Ontario to a two-year wage freeze, as well as a 1.5% pay cut in the form of three unpaid PD days. So this bill also limited the legality of teachers' unions and support staff going on strike. And so when the teachers tried to stand against it, and they went on one-day rotating strikes, they made plans for a full walkout, but it was ruled illegal by the Ontario Labor Relations Board. Teachers continued to fight this in court for years, but in the meantime, there was another round of bargaining. And again, the government, this time led by Kathleen Wynne, attacked teachers. And in April of 2014, the government mandated a restructuring of bargaining, and it heavily centralized the bargaining process. Now, following this round of bargaining, there was a number of localized strikes, a minimal contract was signed, because the threat of back-to-work legislation and bargaining mandates took away all of the union's power. They took 0, 1, 1, 0 0.5. Then in 2016, Bill 115 was overturned by the courts. On April 20th, the Ontario Superior Court of Justice ruled, quote, that between the fall of 2011 and the passage of the Putting Students First Act, Ontario infringed on the applicant's right under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms to meaningful collective bargaining. The, rule, the judge also said, quote, when reviewed in the context of the Charter and the rights it provides, it becomes apparent that the process engaged in was fundamentally flawed. It could not, by its design, provide meaningful collective bargaining. Ontario on its own devised a process. It set the parameters which would allow it to meet fiscal restraints it determined and then set a program which limited the ability of other parties to take part in a meaningful way. Basically, they shut down the teacher's ability to bargain. They violated their constitutional rights. And this court win did change the bargaining landscape, but teachers still took an extension to the contract. They got low numbers yet again. One and a half, one, one, 0 0.5. Although the last two were in the span of one year at different points. Then the 2019 bargaining round came, and I'll break down the reasons why this got contentious in a minute, and the teachers were really hurt in this bargaining cycle, but for now let's just look at the numbers. It was one, one, and one. And that contract expires, we wind up here. Every step of the way, Ontario teachers have fallen behind inflation, lost supports, and tried to fight for their classrooms, but the government has fought against them and used the power of the law to do so. Now, in Saskatchewan, things were a little bit different. Teacher wages and funding were fairly good under the NDP government until the Saskatchewan party took over in 2007. And the first contract that was fully negotiated under the SAS party in 2010 led to a three-day withdrawal of professional service. It wasn't quite a strike, it was something, there was a study day and then there was two days of picketing, um, but there was a defined period of time, so it was called a withdrawal of professional service. And it was the first time in my life I ever walked on a picket line, and it was the first taste I got of just how much some people hate teachers. I had drinks thrown at me from car windows, I got bumped by cars at crosswalks, and it made me realize that some people just hate teachers for being teachers. Some people screamed at me for having summer vacation. Like, that wasn't my idea. This was followed by a work to rule, and then it went to a special mediation which led to a deal. Uh, it shrank the teacher salary grid in Saskatchewan from 15 steps to 11, which was a big positive that got people to their highest earning years a lot quicker. Um, it's hard to break down, but it amounts to an increase of about 6 to 10% for each step, plus 1, 2, and 2. Um, then in 2013, there were negotiations yet again, and they went terribly. Two contracts were rejected by the membership, so the union leadership sent the contracts to the membership, 
the membership said no. As a result, this went to a conciliation board, and when the board returned its report, the STF was essentially told, here's the final offer, take it or leave it. And as a result, the executive accepted the contract and did not give the membership a chance to vote on it. Now, this was obviously an unpopular decision, and it led to a near total replacement of the executive of the STF. But uh, during that negotiation, they fought for class size and complexity as well, but there was no movement. Classes were still overfilling, funding was still shrinking. Um, the conciliation board basically punted on that issue and said, figure it out next contract. As a result of this, we got 1.85, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9. 9. Now in 2017, things changed a little bit. So in Saskatchewan, there's two different types of teacher bargaining, route A or route B. Route A is basically you bargain, and as soon as an impasse is declared, you go to binding arbitration. Route B is the standard, where you sort of go through the negotiations, conciliation, mediation, strike, all that. So this time, the teachers chose Route A for the first time, um, and it went to arbitration fairly quickly. As a result, a bunch of things happened. First of all, teacher time got defined, which was quite a big step. Um, that led to teacher time being assigned at 1,044 hours a year of assigned time. Assigned time is a little bit complicated, but suffice it to say, it defined the teacher day a little bit more. Um, it also, <laughs> so the uh, Saskatchewan government basically imposed a regulatory board on teachers called the Saskatchewan Professional Teachers Regulatory Board. Um, and then they told us that we would have to pay fees. Um, and then they very generously told us they would cover the fees for us. And so this was included in the contract this time around. And then we also got increases of zero, zero, and one. Um, and no decision at all on class size and complexity. Now, the government made it sound like it wasn't allowed to be negotiated, like the teachers just couldn't, but the arbitrator just didn't want to rule on it. They said it had to be negotiated at the table. So following that, um, the SAS government didn't like how Route A went because the teachers got some of the things that they wanted. So as a result, they just eliminated Route A. They just took away that option because teacher rights aren't a thing they're big fans of. And now in the 2019-2020 round of bargaining, this is where circumstances in Saskatchewan and Ontario start to align. In both provinces, the teachers were ready to fight. They were tired, they were beaten down, their classes were overstuffed, underfunded, and struggling. And teachers were fairly united. And then in both provinces, work to rule was implemented as part of negotiations. Then in both provinces, COVID arrived and threw a wrench in the works. There was a lot of uncertainty. Teachers didn't want to appear greedy while people were getting laid off. Governments didn't want to appear heartless. So everybody just sort of agreed to sign contracts that deferred on a number of big issues. So in Ontario, they wound up with one, one, and one, and a support for students fund. In Saskatchewan, we got zero, two, two, and two, and a committee on class size and complexity. Now, of course, that committee has been slow walked the whole way, and now three years later, we still don't have the report as we're in this round of bargaining. They are really dragging their feet because reports are where these sort of things go to die, apparently. But at every step, rights have been stripped from teachers and wages have nowhere near kept up with the consumer price index. In Ontario, since 2012, the ETFO salaries have risen by only 5%. In Saskatchewan, 14.55%. In that same time, the consumer price index has risen by 27.5%. Teachers are losing purchasing power. At the same time, job conditions are worsening. They're losing supports. Class sizes are growing. In Saskatchewan, we've moved from the highest ed funding in the country to the second lowest. It's time to fight, and it's time for the public to stand with the teachers and the schools. But I think it's important to point at, what are the teachers actually asking for here? Primarily, in both Ontario and Saskatchewan, the asks center around working conditions. Now, bargaining packages aren't public, but the STF has been very clear that a deal without movement on class size and complexity is a non-starter. The government refuses to even discuss it. They offered 3, 2, and 2, which isn't even close to CPI. And in Ontario, the ETFO has asked for CPI plus one each year for four years to try to regain some of the purchasing power that they've lost over the last decade. It still doesn't catch them up, but it's a start. They're also seeking class size caps. For primary grades, the union's proposing 90% of classes should have 20 or fewer students with no class exceeding 23. They're also asking for the government to put limits on the number of split classes in grades 3 and 4, with limits between 24 and 27 students per class. The government's offering 1.25 each year for four years, no movement on class size and complexity. Nothing else. This may get ugly. Teachers are ready to fight we're overworked, overstressed, underpaid, and we face a widespread teaching shortage. In Quebec alone, they're short 8,000 teachers. 
They're not even able to put a qualified teacher in every classroom. They're just promising that you'll have an adult. Economics apply to teachers. When you have a shortage, you have to up wages and improve working conditions. That's how this works. But there's more than that. Teacher working conditions are student learning conditions. We're fighting to improve the classrooms your kids attend. Governments try to villainize teachers, making us sound greedy for exercising our labor rights and going on strike or working to rule. But we are fighting not only for our salaries, we're also fighting for your kids. We're fighting for funding for the classrooms. We're fighting for supports. We're fighting for smaller class sizes. Stand with us. Fight for better. Nearly everyone you interact with in your life will attend public school. Your doctors, your lawyers, everyone you will depend on. Why don't you want them to have the best possible education? And governments love to tell these stories about how teachers are constantly on strike and constantly out of the classroom. I've been a teacher in Saskatchewan for 16 years. I've been on strike for three days, total. In Ontario, since 2012, also three days. Strikes are not a constant issue, they're a last resort. What are teachers supposed to do? Accept another contract that shrinks our wages? Stand by as our classes overflow? We can't stand by and watch it happen. So if you're a teacher, get involved in your federation, go to meetings, attend rallies, and engage with policy. If you're in the OSSTF, vote against arbitration. This is an attempt to trick you into giving away your bargaining power. Don't fall for it. It's a trap and you'll only lose. Look at Saskatchewan. Every time we've asked outside support to help us improve class size and complexity, they've let us down. If you're a parent, get loud. Now's the time to stand with teachers in schools. Don't let governments distract you by trying to whip up culture wars. They are just trying to weaponize hatred to distract from their policy failures. If we don't take care of teachers in schools, there won't be any left. Quebec's already seeing this and there's sub shortages across the country. And when education collapses, the answer is going to be to lower standards. They're going to make non-qualified people allowed to teach. We can't let it happen. Schools aren't daycares. They're rich, vibrant centers of our society. They build the next generation. So stand with schools and stand with teachers because we're trying to stand up for your kids. Thanks for listening. Take care of yourselves.